good afternoon, everyone. So let me start by introducing myself. So I got my undergrad and master's at CMU. So I think I saw some CMU people here. So that's great. Uh, and I got my PhD at uh, Stanford in 2013. And since then, I moved to Singapore. So I'm currently, uh, I have an adjunct position at the Nanyang Technology University, which is one of the uh, two big universities in Singapore. I'm also associated with the uh, Institute for Infocom Research. So can I have a quick show of hands? So how many computer vision people do we have in this room? OK, handful, so that's good. OK, good. So I'll keep it as high level as possible so that you guys can appreciate some of this. So, uh, so I'll start by introducing ASTAR. So if you guys are looking for a fun summer internship like halfway across the globe, uh, ASTAR is a good option. So we are, think of us as the, uh, the National Science Foundation of the US. So we're like a big funding agency. Uh, it's, I think, a, a couple of billion dollars a year at this point, which is huge for a small country like Singapore. Uh, we have lots of research institutes, so across uh, biomedical and the biomedical side and the uh, science and engineering side. Uh, so we have about 5,000 uh, scientists. They're from all over the world. Uh, and we also have like a commercialization arm. We work closely with the industry. So uh, think of us as like, for people familiar with the German research system, like think of us like more Fraunhofer, like less Max Planck. So we work on more translational work, uh, like sort of uh, engage with a lot of different industry partners. So anyways, that's a quick, uh, so this is the outline of the talk. So I'll just start with what's image retrieval. So, so far, I think we've had a few talks in computer vision. So I thought we can deep dive on image retrieval, which is a slightly different problem than image classification. So we'll start with uh, an overview of that. Uh, so we'll talk about what image retrieval looked like pre-deep learning, what happened post-deep learning, and then sort of like some of the challenges ahead. Uh, this is, there's a panel discussion on uh, industrial related stuff. So uh, we'll talk briefly about sort of some of the opportunities in this space. So basic image retrieval, so this is, uh, so image instance retrieval is different from the image classification problem. So image classification problem, think of it as like cat or dog, right? Uh, image in instance retrieval is like find me that specific cat, or for example, in this particular example, find me this very specific building from a large database. So it's finding the exact instance of the object rather than just the general class it belongs to. And it's a pretty challenging problem because there are lots of like, uh, things you have to be sort of uh, invariant to. There's, there are changes in lighting conditions, scale, rotation, blur, uh, lighting effects, et cetera. And also, like, especially for outdoor environments, <laughs> the environment changes uh, can be quite significant across two same, two same pictures. Uh, lots of applications for visual search. Uh, we've seen sort of a lot of companies in this space that are involved in comparison shopping, augmented TV, uh, like vine recognition apps. Uh, so visual search is slowly sort of making its way up uh, uh, many industries. So let's think of like text retrieval, right, before we jump into image retrieval. So here's the, the American Declaration of Independence. So this has words like, for example, self-evident, like liberty, truth, happiness, right? So when you search uh, declara Declaration of Independence on Google or any of these words, this document pops up, right? So essentially what Google does behind the scenes is converts this document to sort of a bag of words, right? where Anytime someone searches for self-evident liberty truths, like there's an inverted list, right, which keeps track of like, okay, these are all the documents that contain this particular word. So in this particular case, like liberty, the, the, the Declaration of Independence would show up as one of the top documents. Uh, so we want to do the same for image retrieval as well. So we're re representing Im an image as a bag of visual words. So what are these words? So these words are like highly localized patches within the, within the image. So here you see like specific structures from the Golden Gate Bridge, which I'll go into how we extract them in a bit. Yeah. So we basically extract these text patches. So here's a high-level pipeline, so it might be useful to just get a good understanding of it. So typically, uh, you'd start off with a color image, uh, you convert it to grayscale, uh, you apply a bunch of filters. So here are like horizontal derivatives, vertical derivatives, uh, mixed derivatives. So that gives you a bunch of images. Uh, you compute a blob response as a function of these. You apply these filters at different scales, and then you basically get the uh, entire scale space of these images. So this is a determinant of Hessian interest point detector. Uh, then you find maxima in these scale space. So maxima meaning you, you have to be higher than all your neighbors up on your same level and above and below. So a 27 pixel neighborhood is looked at. Uh, you find a maximum, and then so these are examples of patches that you get at different scales. And then you sort of orient each one of these along a dominant gradient. 
you get a, uh, something that looks like that. And then for each one of these patches, you basically go compute a gradient field, uh, and then compute a bunch of interesting statistics on it. So a good example would be SIFT and SURF, which most people are probably familiar with. Uh, so SIFT and SURF uh, extract sort of like interesting gradient statistics from the patch. So in this particular example, the patch is divided into smaller sub-patches, and in each one of these patches, uh, you extract information like the average gradient magnitude or the average uh, sum of like uh, x and y gradients. And that sort of gives you a descriptor which sort of describes uh, that particular patch. So this is your visual word similar to what your uh, textual words are. But these uh, descriptors tend to be sort of very high dimensional. Uh, so you end up sort of quantizing them. So uh, for people familiar with quantization techniques, think of this as just k-means. So, but then the space is very, very large. K, like if you have millions of code words, you don't want to do flat k-means. You tend to typically do it in a hierarchical fashion, which means you have, for example, here, three cluster centers, and then you sort of hierarchically cluster, cluster this data. And each one of these leaf nodes or intermediate nodes represents sort of like a, a visual word, uh, an analogous to the textual words we talked about. So that's what you do uh, to describe the image. So what happens at query time? It's exactly what, uh, similar to what Google does. In comes an image, you quantize it to a bunch of words, and then all the items in the database sort of like rank against it. So the image which has the highest number of visual words in common will end up being the most relevant image. So for example, in this particular case, the first image of the CD cover. So there are two steps in the process. The first step sort of like gives you an approximate result. Uh, for what's different in computer vision is you have to sort of like find, often you need to find the exact image, right? You want very high precision. So you want your answer to be absolutely right, which is precision one. Uh, the way you get close to precision one is by applying geometric consistency checks. So these are algorithms like RANSAC where you sort of start matching these point features Within, the pa within pairs of images. So for example, here are sort of feature matches from these two CDs. There's obviously no ge valid geometric transform between these images, so that would not pass a geometric check. Uh, here again, no, and then you, go, you keep walking down the list till you find the right answer, which sort of has a valid geometric transform between the two. So image retrieval can be bro broadly classified as two steps, like find an approximate set of matches, and then sort of find the, the exact one by applying uh, some geometric transforms. Uh, so these are the kind of data sets people work with. Uh, so if you think of like image classification, everyone looks at ImageNet uh, for retrieval. So you look at data sets like the Oxford Buildings data set. Uh, there's a Stanford Mobile Visual Search data set, which I was, I was involved in collecting like a few years ago. Uh, there's a University of Kentucky benchmark, and there's like Inria Holidays. And these data sets are typically sort of like scene-centric or object-centric. So object-centric refers to like indoor objects. Scenes sort of are like, like outdoor scenes. So if you were working on this problem, sort of these are the data sets you would work with. That was a simple retrieval pipeline, which showed how the text retrieval systems and these image retrieval systems are uh, analogous to each other. So I'll go into some of these image retrieval building blocks of like a, sli uh, like a more advanced retrieval system. And then so the first one I'll talk about is pre-deep learning, and then we'll see how what happened post-deep learning and how like both of them are still sort of relevant today. So pre-deep learning, so I think there's uh, a quick call out here, is there's actually an MPEG standard on computer vision. So MPEG, so these are the guys who did all our video codecs, the audio codecs, so they actually have an excellent standard on computer vision where many, many universities and companies participated in this for a period of like three, four years. So they have, if you want to get uh, up and running, you can download this piece of software and use it, sort of benchmark yourself. Uh, so here's what an image feature extraction pipeline looks like. So you start off with the query image, uh, you extract some interest points. So this was similar to the, uh, the interest point detector I showed before. You extract some descriptors. Then there's some feature selection. There's some compression. And then you sort of like have two descriptors. You have a global descriptor and a local descriptor. And then that sort of gives you a representation of the image. So I'll quickly walk through some of these blocks just to give you an idea what, what it looks like. So local feature selection. So typically, like, all features are not equal, right? So when you try to match images, you quickly realize that like features that tend, are very small tend to be like more noisy. Features that are too big tend to be sort of like uh, unstable as well. Uh, features that have a higher peak response tend to be more repeatable. So you can sort of apply statistical methods to figure out like which features are sort of more important than others. And these are like not 
individual dimensions of a single descriptor as much as like different features uh, that you collect. So each image produces probably like a couple of thousand features, and you want to sort of rank these features to figure out which ones are more important than others. So that feature selection step helps you do that. Uh, then feature descriptor compression. So what happens? So here's. Uh, so these feature descriptors tend to be uh, very high dimensional. So if you look at the SIF descriptor, which is like the benchmark, it's almost 1,000 bits per descriptor. So even if you have a few thousand of these descriptors, you, ends up, uh, you end up having uh, like hundreds of kilobytes or even up to a megabyte for a single image. Um, so then that's the amount of data that is larger than the size of the image itself. So how do you compress some of these descriptors? Uh, so here is one of the state-of-the-art techniques where it sort of uh, compresses distributions of data. So most descriptors are based on gradient distributions because they capture the, uh, the patch statistics very in, a, in a very robust fashion. So here uh, you have a gradient angle distribution, which is just the statistics of the uh, gradient angle across the patch. Uh, so this data lies in a very specific portion of the space. In this place, it lies in, for example, what we call the AN simplex in 3D, which is just a bunch of points which sum up to one. Uh, you can do some clever things. You can sort of like uh, so, so you can uh, so feature descriptors based on histograms tend to lie in this uh, probability simplex. So now you can sort of start placing points and quantizing points on this particular uh, simplex. So there's a, a this work I'd like to point you guys to, which talks about how to compress distributions, and you can reduce the size of data by an order of magnitude without losing performance. Uh, so that's image compression. So global descriptor. So think of global descriptors as, a, like, typically databases are very, very large. You typically have millions or tens of millions of images. Uh, you want to get search results back typically in a few hundred milliseconds. So what you want to do is typically compare your you want to extract a really f good descriptor from your image, your query image, and then compare it to descriptors from the database. And typically, you want them to be binary, so you can make really, really fast comparisons. Uh, a really th simple global descriptor is one based on bag of words. So think of like you have a dictionary, like this is hierarchical k-means, and you sort of just keep track of the counts in each bin. So that's a good example of a global descriptor. Uh, but that is a very simple one. People have proposed more uh, sophisticated ones. So for example, most state-of-the-art global descriptors are based on sort of extracting residual statistics in each one of these bins. So an example of that is you start off with a bunch of descriptors. You start quantizing them into these different bins. You compute the residual vector for each bin. And you sort of aggregate these statistics. And you have sort of a representation for each bin. You concatenate all of these, and you get a so-called global descriptor, which uh, represents the image. So a high-level overview, you start off with a query image. You extract a bunch of local features. You quantize them to a very small code book. Uh, then you sort of aggregate the residuals in each code word. Uh, then typically, these are still very high dimensional, so you reduce the, tra reduce the dimensionality. You binarize them, and then you sort of have a global descriptor that represents the image. And this is a powerful representation, typically, because you can then compare them directly if they're binary and retrieve very similar images from a large database. And where does the code book come from? Yeah, the code book is trained from a large number of like image patches. So you'd extract a lot of features, and you would train them. And typically, these code books tend to be small. Uh, so you quantize them and then sort of ag aggregate some statistics in each one of these bins. So this is like a typical global descriptor pipeline. There are like many, many variants of it. Uh, so, that's, so this was a general image feature extraction pipeline before deep learning, right? So a quick recap. You need some interest point detector, something like a difference of Gaussian detector, determinant of SCN. There are many more. So this gives you sort of invariance to scale, invariance to rotation, some invariance to lighting conditions. Then you sort of need some sort of feature descriptor. So this is what describes each individual patch in the image. Uh, you need some sort of feature selection to discard the good I mean, to find the good ones from the, bu the bad ones, uh, which are typically based on statistical methods. These features tend to be really high dimensional, so they need to be compressed. So you typically 
use uh, techniques from the compression literature for compressing them. Uh, and then you have sort of also a global descriptor which sort of represents the entire image. So there, these are like some of the techniques like VLAD, Fisher vectors, Rev, these are examples of global descriptors that are obtained by aggregating sort of residual statistics. So that was the general image feature extraction pipeline before deep learning. So what happened after deep learning? So deep learning, so, so deep learning's back. Uh, so we've, we've talked about uh, deep learning in many of these tutorials, like lots of, lots of data, lots of computing power, and essentially lots of incremental innovation the last few years have driven uh, this trend up. Obviously, there's remarkable performance on every single task, like image classification, face recognition, pedestrian detection, uh, pose estimation, et cetera. So each one of these tasks, like deep learning, is pretty much uh, at the top of the table now. But there's something different for image retrieval, and I'll go into it uh, next. So networks are getting deeper. So like, for example, the AlexNet was just seven layers. Uh, the Oxford Net, which is very popular, is like 16. Uh, Google's uh, Inception uh, network was 19, and then Microsoft's deep networks have like hundreds to even like thousands of layers using a residual trick. Uh, so, so, so that's for the classification problem, right? So the first problem is how do we sort of extract CNN descriptors for the image retrieval problem, right? So if you went all the way, so if you look at a deep network, right, typically the data on the left, the first layer is just the image itself, and then your last layer is like the class label, right, cat. So as you go deeper and deeper, the layers become more and more semantic, right? So for the image classification problem, you typically just care about the final layer. Uh, but I can't use the final layer for image retrieval, right? Because let's say I had two different cats. They would get mapped to the exact same representation using a deep network, right? While I want to find a specific cat from a large database. So it's a different problem. So how do you sort of uh, extract CNN descriptors for the image instance retrieval problem, so what people do is they end up using an intermediate layer in the network. So these are four different data sets, like Holidays, Oxford, UK Bench, Graphics. So on the x-axis is the layer in the network. So Pool 5, FC6, as you're going deeper and deeper. On the y-axis, you have like a performance measure. So typically for most of these data sets, what works really well is just extracting an intermediate layer from the network and then sort of using that for image retrieval. And that seems to work pretty well. Uh, that's the first, first thing that people have started doing after like deep learning happened. Uh, second, uh, people have realized there's very little invariance with CNN descriptors, right? Even though they're trained with lots of data augmentation at training time, for the image retrieval problem, invariance is very important. Like you have to get the same object even if it's scaled, rotated, or under different lighting conditions. So here's an example of results with the CNN. Uh, so you're rotating the query. On the y-axis, you have some uh, retrieval measure, like mean average precision. And you have like the first fully connected layer of the Oxford net. And as you rotate the query, performance drops pretty rapidly, which is bad. But if you look at uh, techniques from, the previous, uh, from, uh, from previous methods, so this is the Fisher vector with difference of Gaussian interest points. This stays relatively flat, because with, uh, with previous techniques, your uh, scale and rotation invariance came from the interest point detector. So the interest point detector found sort of patches at different scales, different rotations, and that sort of gave you invariance. So you had invariance while uh, even as, for example, you had invariance to rotation, and you had invariance to scale as well to a certain degree which is why the performance of these previous methods stay roughly flat, like the Fisher vector with difference of Gaussian interest points. But then the peak performance for the CNN is better, so sort of you need like the best of both worlds. Like want better performance from the CNN, but I also sort of want invariance, which existed in the uh, previous set of techniques. Um, so how do you gain invariance? So I think, uh, so we've used uh, techniques proposed by Poggio in his recent work on iTheory. Uh, in, a, in a broad nutshell, like iTheory says that if you extract descriptors on sort of uh, groups rather than on an individual image, you can sort of be invariant to that group of transformations. So if I go extract a descriptor based, on, based off of an orbit, uh, the orbit corresponds to some transformation group. And it's, if I extract a descriptor which is invariant, uh, for example, based on a distribution, I would be invariant to that particular transformation group. So CNNs inherently are invariant to local translations because uh, 
you can think of these convolutions as templates. And by sort of max pooling uh, in locally, you are sort of gaining translation invariance. Uh, the computing moments like the max give you, that pooling operation gives you essentially invariance to local transformations. But what it doesn't have is it has very limited invariance to scale and rotation. So here's some work which we did recently with Tommy on how to sort of incorporate scale and rotation invariance for the image retrieval problem. So this is for the image retrieval problem, which is slightly different from the image classification problem. And this technique involves sort of like uh, using a bunch of transformations and then sort of nesting them and then computing sort of invariant representations based on like higher and higher moments for computing representations that are completely invariant to a group of transformations. So I won't go into the detail here, but uh, then here's another technique in deep learning, which is very popular for the instance retrieval problem. So for the image classification problem, what you would do is you first, like for any problem today, what you would do is first go train your network on the hardest possible problem ever that you can find, right? So you would start off by training on ImageNet. And then let's say you had food classification, you would sort of take that network and then fine tune for your specific problem, right? Image retrieval, what do you do is, I mean, there's no notion of classes. So you typically fine tune based on triplet networks. So what you do is you first train your network on the hardest possible problem, for example, ImageNet, then bring it back for your specific database, and you tell this network, look, you define a bunch of matching pairs and non-matching pairs. So the matching pairs are images that correspond to the same object. Non-matching pairs are, are pairs that correspond to different objects. And you say, network, bring the matching pairs closer and the non-matching pairs like further apart. So the triplet network sort of learns and fine tunes the parameters and adapts it for like a given data set. So that's fine tuning. There's RCNN for image uh, object detection. Uh, people have, some, uh, prefer, have proposed something similar for the image retrieval problem as well. So RMAC is what RCNN is for uh, object detection. R RMAC is this equivalent for sort of like image retrieval where people sort of do clever pooling across a bunch of reg regions to then sort of obtain a representation. Uh, so a bunch of recent papers on this, one from like ICLR just this year. Uh, then people have also started, uh, so with image retrieval, there's still a lot of benefits from the previous pipeline. So with image retrieval, there's a lot of good stuff before deep learning came along as well. Uh, good stuff is like interest point detectors are still very much relevant today, right? Because they, they give you precise scale and rotation invariance. A lot of these global descriptors are really powerful as well because they, they sort of aggregate a bunch of local, local descriptors which are then sort of like hashed. So people have started sort of combining these two as well. Uh, the beauty of these end-to-end -end learning systems is you can throw all kinds of crazy stuff into the network. So here's an example of where people have thrown the entire like, like global descriptor pipeline, which is the aggregation st stuff I talked about, into the CNN pipeline, where you sort of like learn everything end-to-end -end, uh, with backprop. And that sort of gives you a more powerful representation rather than learning some of these things independently. Yes, yeah. So it's, they all belong to a class of global descriptors. So Vlad is one specific one, which aggregates these residuals that I talked about. Uh, so hashing, uh, so people have applied like RBMs to it. So typically these descriptors tend to be extremely high dimensional. Like typically uh, it can go up to like tens of thousands. So how do you come up with extremely compact representations? That's very important for retrieval because you're searching like very large databases. Uh, so people have used like stacked RBMs, uh, give like the best performance uh, for sort of coming up with extremely compact representations for some of these very high dimensional descriptors. So a few references here. Uh, so that was sort of like uh, a quick whirlwind tour of like deep learning for image retrieval. So if you guys are interested, you can always go and look up some of all those important references uh, that I found. So challenges ahead. Uh, what are like some really interesting problems to work on? So still, like image retrieval, it works very well when it when things are like objects are rigid, planar, textured, right? Like that's where like still state of the art pipelines nail it, right? But textureless objects are still pretty hard. There's still plenty of databases where you have like 50% like MAP. Uh, 3D objects are hard. Reflective surfaces are hard. Transparent objects are hard. Non-rigid objects are hard. So these are still sort of like hard, especially if you want to sort of achieve like very high precision retrieval. And for lots of image retrieval applications, like high precision is really important. Like I want precision one. I want to determine 
it, it, I, I just don't want the wrong answer. I just want just the right answer. And when that's the case, like these, all these scenarios are still very challenging. Uh, so, so far we've seen image retrieval, so video is the next frontier. So if you think of like all the products in the world, there probably aren't more than a million products, but it's very easy to sort of get billions of video frames, right? So how do you sort of retrieve from very large databases? So video sort of is the next frontier. And for most of these large video databases, the performance drops pretty quickly as sort of the size of the database grows. So how do you make your retrieval more robust, especially when database size increases? So that's another interesting problem to work on. So streaming mobile augmented reality, there's still lots of interesting challenges there. So think of this as the, the Pokemon Go scenario, right? If you, if you played Pokemon Go right now, there's no visual search in the loop. Like the Pokemon Go character just sticks on some surface and then runs around, right? But like a few years down the road, hopefully you want Pokemon Go to also understand the environment around you, recognize all the objects there from a large database, and then sort of then do interesting overlays. So that's actually a lot of data. How do you sort of like build systems like that? That's still quite challenging because if data has to go back and forth between a server, you won't have sort of real time performance. There's very little work on sort of mathematical modeling of retrieval systems. So that with which any of these retrieval systems, there's a lot of parameters, right? Typically, if you have code books, uh, you typically have uh, a bunch of parameters associated with the code book. Um, like you can change knobs in the number of sort of like features query in the query image versus how many features to extract on the database side. Uh, how many images down the list should I sort of uh, check to achieve a certain precision level? Uh, how, like, what's my performance, the size of the database grows. So I think it's, it's, it's a little difficult to go run each one of these experiments as you change parameters. So what would be nice to have is some mathematical modeling so that gives you intuition on how to choose like hyperparameters. So it's a pretty exciting area of topic. There's very little work on this. So there's some uh, that came out a few years ago. Uh, I think for image retrieval, like all the work before pre-deep uh, pre learning is just as relevant as the, one, the ones that came after. So how do you combine the best of both worlds? You want sort of some of the best of like SIFT, like the scale rotation invariance that came from the interest point detector, but you also want the more powerful representations that come from CNNs. How do you sort of combine them, et cetera? So that's sort of also interesting to work on. Uh, so hashing is an interesting problem to work on. So these are like some state of the art results. So on the x axis is the size of the descriptor and bits. Uh, on the y axis, you have recall, right? So ideally, as you want sort of like even at 64 bits. So 64 bits is a lot, right? So smaller the representation, the faster you can search. Like 64 bits can represent like two to the power of 64 items in the universe, right? So that's a lot. Uh, so how do we? But then if you look at these curves, performance starts dropping very rapidly as the size of the hash decreases. So how do we come up with representations that are really compact but sort of have really good performance? So that's also a fun problem to work on. Uh, so anyways, that's like some of like the uh, interesting challenges in image retrieval. I think there are lots of interesting problems to work on, lots of sort of open problems as well. Uh, and finally, this is the last bullet I had, so opportunities ahead. So I think we have a panel discussion afterwards, so maybe there'll be uh, some interesting food for thought here. So deep learning uh, is being called a $500 billion opportunity in the last 10 years. So I'm always a bit skeptical of some of these reports, but for what it's worth, that, that's a couple of graphs there. So there are two graphs there. So there's hardware and there's software and services. Uh, so hardware is going to be about five billion a year, ten years from now, and then software is going to be a hundred, right? And I think what's really interesting about AI is that it's sort of touching every single sector, right? Like people are using these uh, algorithms, these tools for sort of improving productivity, for improving revenue, for increasing revenue across sort of all these sectors. So it's not unimaginable that this is a half a trillion dollar opportunity in the next 10 years. So what does the deep learning landscape today look like? So roughly, like, if you think about it, like going from the bottom, right? So you have hardware. So pretty much NVIDIA today dominates hardware. So they've, they've built some of the best hardware out there for deep learning. Uh, what they've done really well is they've provided like SDKs and they've sort of accelerated every piece of software out there on their hardware, making their ecosystem extremely sticky. So they have like, uh, CUDA DNN, Kublas, et cetera. So they keep optimizing uh, all the software to run on their platform. And it's amazing how like a lot of fundamental work that was done on FFTs and all that is still back now again, because if you can sort of train, reduce training time by even a factor of two, that's still significant. 
because when you're training over, let's say, a few hundred thousand hours of data, it still takes weeks. So if I can improve even my FFT by a factor of two using some technique that was proposed in the 1960s, I can sort of bring that training down to like a week from two weeks. So uh, NVIDIA is providing a lot of these libraries. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of software in the open source. So pretty much everyone at this point has open sourced their deep learning stack. Uh, TensorFlow is very popular today. Cafe has done a great job. Microsoft has CNTK, like uh, Facebook uses Torch and Theano. Uh, Twitter had something as well, I forget the name, but pretty much everyone's deep learning stack is in the open source. So you have the hardware, and then you have these platforms, and then on top you have all kinds of interesting applications with pretty much build on these same building blocks. Uh, a lot of these building blocks are also available in the open source today. So there's building blocks for vision, speech, like behavior, et cetera. So that's sort of what the landscape looks like. I think maybe during the panel discussion we can talk about sort of interesting companies that have been sort of built at every step. So I think at the hardware level, we just saw a big exit. Uh, There's a company called Nirvana, which got acquired by Intel for about 400 million. Uh, there are plenty of uh, exits at the platform level as well. I think we have MetaMind here today. There's also like Hinton's company, which got acquired. There was DeepMind, which got acquired. Uh, but I think for starting one of those platform companies, I think you had to start it like a few years ago, because now what was considered like very esoteric like two, three years ago is now pretty much uh, a lot of it's common knowledge. Um, and then there are obviously all kinds of interesting end-to-end -end applications. So here's an example of what we call a full stack company, where you build an end-to-end -end system. Uh, so Mobileye, which was, I think, one of Tommy's students, uh, is now a billion dollar company. They have a camera system that sort of like recognizes uh, pedestrians real time. It's used for like assistive driving, autonomous driving, uh, et cetera. So all kinds of interesting companies to be built across the stack. Hopefully, uh, let's end with, uh, I just want to end with saying that AI is not going to kill us. This is crazy talk. So anyways, that's the last slide I had. Any questions?